In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. So way back when I went to uh, seminary and was doing field education, when Trinity Sunday would roll around, they would always look at the newbie and say, you get to preach on Trinity Sunday. Good luck. <laughs> Trinity Sunday is a wonderful, wonderful celebration of the church. But most of us, I imagine, myself included, for many years just assumed that the Holy Trinity had always been and would always be. But you know, that isn't quite how it happened. The development of the Trinity in the theological terms was not an overnight discovery, nor did it come into acceptance easily. It was a process, a long, long, long process. Believe it or not, from its inception until its final form as we see it in the Nicene Creed, it took seven hundred years. Isn't that amazing? Now during this time, there was a lot of turmoil and people of faith, believe it or not, actually fought to the death over the nature of the Holy Trinity. I'm pretty sure that God and our Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit didn't teach us to do that. But Let's take a few minutes and kind of retrace how the Trinity came to be the theological pinnacle, if you will, of Christianity. Now, as you know, Christianity didn't just pop up out of the ground all on its own. We were born and raised within the Jewish faith, and more importantly than that, we came from a belief in one God, just one, monotheism. Now, there are two other monotheistic beliefs, Judaism and Islam. And I have friends that are both. And they think that all Christians failed monotheism 101. <laughs> they go, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. My math's not too good, but that adds up to three. How do you end up with one? Well, it's a really good question, and it's one that we didn't easily solve. Now, Judaism is the most ancient of all the monotheistic beliefs, and it dates back more than 5,000 years ago. However, when it started out, it didn't believe in just one God either. As a matter of fact, if you pay close attention to the Old Testament, you'll see that there's often reference to other gods. In Genesis and the creation story, the language that was used in when man was created, we will, we will create them in our image. <clears throat> Definitely a plural statement. You remember the, the story of the Tower of Babel? All the folks were starting to get pretty frisky. And God looked down there and said, boy, you know, if we don't do something, Pretty soon they're gonna be like us. So they introduced different languages so that we couldn't communicate. And we haven't done very well communicating since. <laughs> so there you go. Once again, it was like us, plural. Even in Exodus, when Moses receives the 10 commandments, what's the first commandment of the 10 commandments? You shall have no other God before me. It didn't say there weren't other gods. It simply said, you can't worship those other gods, only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, when the Israelites finally reached the promised land, they found a whole lot of people there that worshiped all sorts of other gods. And they had no idea who this God of Israel was. And as they occupied the land, and they became the dominant culture, the belief in one God above all other gods began to take shape. But as you read the books in the Bible, and particularly Kings 1 and 2, 
you will find that the rulers of Israel had a hard time following that first commandment. And because they didn't follow it particularly well and they worshiped all kinds of outside idols and asher poles and stones, tragedy befell the kingdom of Israel. Eventually, the kingdom of Israel was destroyed and the people were dispersed throughout what we would call the Middle East today in the diaspora. Now, upon their return, during the time that the second temple was being built, the idea of other gods had pretty much faded away. The belief in one God and one God only who created all things is firmly implanted in the Jewish faith. You heard it this morning in the psalm, didn't you? Yeah. Now, let's fast forward, if you will, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. As I said earlier, Christianity was birthed from Judaism, and the primary belief is that there is only one God, the creator of all things. However, with the belief in Jesus, his divinity presents a significant problem. If Jesus is divine, how does that square with our belief in one God? Now, at the start, as you remember your history, Christianity was not well accepted within the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, it was pretty much outlawed and we went through a period of persecution until the Emperor Constantine comes to power. And he sees, as he's about to take the city of Rome, looks into the sky and sees a cross as a sign of his battle cry, if you will. And he wins the battle, he becomes the emperor, and eventually he adopts Christianity as the faith of the empire. So this all occurred in the fourth century. Now we've got a problem. We're 300 plus years down the road from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and we're still arguing about not who Jesus was, but what he was. His question of what type of divinity this man possessed became the greatest controversy in that period of time in the church. And there was about to be a major schism in the entire empire because there was bishops was opposing views. And we think today, well, you know, that's just religion over here. But at that time, the church and the state were one. They were not separate. So bishops were your political leaders as well as your religious leaders. And if there was conflict between the bishops, it meant the entire empire was in conflict, and it was. The empire at this time could have self-destructed with just a little push. So Constantine says something has to be done and something has to be done quickly. So he called for the Council of Nicaea in 325 to solve the problem. Now, there were two bishops that were really at the center of this big controversy over the divinity of Christ. Not whether Christ was divine, but how did that divinity work itself out? Now, the first, these two bishops were both from the city of Alexandria in Egypt. One of them was named Arius, and the other was Athanasius, common spelling. <laughs> now, here's what Arius argued. He says, Jesus' divinity was secondary, secondary to God. Yes, he's divine. He's a prodigy. But 
He is the Son of God. And that's not the same thing as God. And he even used Scripture. We had 300 years down the road, we had Scripture that we could actually go back to. Now the New Testament was coming into fruition, so people would go to it. And Arius went to it, and he says, look, here in Mark, you recall the story of a young man that comes to Jesus and says, how am I going to gain eternal life? And he frames it like this. He says, good teacher, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at him and loved him, and he said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And that's in Mark 10, 17. Now, Athanasius, on the other hand, argued that Jesus was in fact God. And he certainly relied upon the incarnational theology that was pre presented in the Gospel of John. Do you all remember the opening words of the Gospel of John? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll share it with you, how about that? In the, in the beginning, this is the opening acclamation in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. That's John, Gospel of John 1 through 3. Now the argument would ultimately pivot around two words in Greek that are very, very similar. The two wor words are, and I'll probably blow the pronunciation, so forgive me, homeousis and homeoasis. Now the meaning of these two words is of a similar substance or of the same substance. Big difference there. Now the incarnational theology of Athanasius wins the day, it prevails. And we have, if you will, the beginning of the Nicene Creed. It wasn't complete, but we started to have some consensus that Jesus was the same substance. Not a similar, but the same substance as God. What we didn't have now, we had Father and Son, but we didn't have the Holy Spirit as yet incorporated into the Nicene Creed or into our creedal statement of belief. And it was another 150 years down the road when we have the Council of Constantinople in 485 and three bishops known as the Cappadocian Fathers introduced a theological argument that says the Holy Spirit is of the same substance. So now we're down the road almost 500 years from Jesus before we start to have some consensus among Christian theologians and Christians as a whole about who and what Jesus was and what this Holy Trinity is. There would be one additional modification of the Nicene Creed before it would come to us in what we know as our final form today and what I call our westernized version of the Nicene Creed. Now, in the westernized version of the Nicene Creed, the Holy Spirit, the last to be added to the Trinity, proceeds, if you remember your Nicene Creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Nicene Creed does not say that. In the original Nicene Creed, it didn't say that either. It said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. What happened was two Spanish monks in the seventh century 
went to visit the Emperor Charlemagne, and they had modified the Nicene Creed in Spain to what we see as the westernized version, that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son, and they used the logic that we use today that if God is both Father and Son, the Holy Spirit must proceed from both. Well, Charlemagne went and said, boy, I agree. And so he incorporates it. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't check with the Eastern Church. He just institutes it. And the Eastern Church was, shall we say, highly irritated that they didn't get consulted about it. But we finally had the Nicene Creed in its final form. And that is how we came to have what we call today our undivided Holy Trinity. So now I'm going to end my historical sermon in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen.